Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Richard Kennedy, and I have the great privilege of serving as the executive director of the Tennessee Commission on Children and Youth. And I'm Bonnie Benneke. I'm with the Department of Children's Services, and I have the great pleasure of working with the uh, coordinating team on the Building Strong Brains. And it's really uh, exciting and great to be up here to see all, everyone. This is a great view up here. So thank you. So as we were um, having meetings and we were planning the agenda for, um, for today, um, we realized that we needed to balance um, the activities with um, lecture and with information sharing as well as some activity. And so Mary was talking with Bonnie and me and said, hey, can you all come up with an activity that will tie into the work? And so we said, absolutely, we could. And so I will tell you that Bonnie and I spent a, a fair amount of time really processing what, what we could really do and, um, and feel like that we came up with a solid idea. So, so we're looking forward to uh, hearing your feedback um, if, uh, as to if we hit the mark or if we missed the mark. So I wanted to let you guys know that Fred McFeely Rogers was an American television personality, musician, puppeteer, writer, producer, and Presbyterian minister. He was known as the creator, composer, producer, head writer, showrunner, and host of the preschool television series, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Each episode began the same way. Mr. Rogers is seen coming home, singing his theme song, Won't You Be My Neighbor, and changing into his sneakers and zippered cardigan sweater, all of which were knitted by his mom. In a typical episode, Rogers might have an earnest conversation with his television audience, interact with live guests, take a field trip to such places as a bakery or a music store, or watch a short film. Typical video subjects included demonstrations of how mechanical objects work, such as bulldozers, or how things are manufactured, such as crayons. Each episode included a trip to Mr. Rogers' neighborhood of make-believe, featuring a trolley with its own chiming theme song, a castle, and the kingdom's citizens, including King Friday the 13th. The subjects discussed in the neighborhood of make-believe often allowed further development of themes discussed in Mr. Rogers' real neighborhood. Mr. Rogers often could be seen feeding his fish in his aquarium during the episodes. Typically, each week's episode explored a major theme, such as going to school for the first time. In 2002, Fred Rogers delivered the commencement address at Dartmouth College. We'd like for you to take a couple of minutes with us and listen to a portion of that address. I have a lot of framed things in my office which people have given to me through the years. And on my walls are Greek and Hebrew and Russian and Chinese. And beside my chair is a French sentence from Saint-Exupéry's Little Prince. It reads, L'essentiel est invisible pour les yeux. What is essential is invisible to the eye. Well, what is essential about you? And who are those who have helped you become the person you are? Anyone who has ever graduated from a college, anyone who has ever been able to sustain a good work, has had at least one person, and often many, who have believed in him or her. We just don't get to be competent human beings without a lot of different investments from others. I'd like to give you all an invisible gift, a gift of a silent minute to think about those who have helped you become who you are today. Some of them may be here right now. Some may be far away. Some, like my astronomy professor, may even be in heaven. But wherever they are, if they've loved you and encouraged you and wanted what was best in life for you, 
they're right inside yourself. And I feel that you deserve quiet time on this special occasion to devote some thought to them. So let's just take a minute in honor of those who have cared about us all along the way. One silent minute. So much like Mr. Rogers gave the graduates an invisible gift of one minute to think about those who helped them become the per person they were at that time, Bonnie and I would like to give you the same invisible gift to take one minute of complete silence to think about one person who helped you become the person you are today. Mr. Rogers once said, as human beings, our job in life is to help people to realize how rare and valuable each one of us really is. That each of us has something no one else has or ever will have. Something inside that is unique to all time. It is our job to encourage each other to discover that uniqueness and to provide ways of developing its expression. Expression is important. Not everyone is an artist, but everyone has an ability to express their thoughts and feelings through images and symbols. On your tables, you will find pencils and paper. What we would like for you to do is to take 10 minutes and create a visual representation or multiple images which represent the person you thought of during your moment of silence. So now that you've completed, or it sounds like pe most people have completed um, their projects, what we'd like for you to do is to share with your neighbor at your table and then we would like for you to get up and to find someone that you don't know and to share your project with them. <clears throat> so as you all start wrapping up your conversations, what we would like to do is we would like to ask that by a show of hands that you tell us who was the person that you felt like or people that you felt like invested in you to make you the, the person that you are. So how many of you talked about your mom? Okay. How many of you talked about your dad? How many of you talked about a step parent? Okay. How many of you talked about another family member? Okay. How many of you talked about a grandparent? Okay. How about a neighbor? Okay. How about a teacher or a coach? Okay. How about a faith leader or your minister or your priest? Okay. How many of you um, talked about a community member, such as a Boy Scout leader, Girl Scout leader, youth coach, 4-H person, someone like that? All right. Thank you all so much for, for sharing that information with, with us and, and the larger group. So in closing, in, in one of his books, Mr. Rogers says, we live in a world in which we need to share responsibility. It's easy to say, it's not my child 
not my community, not my world, not my problem. Then there are those who see the need and respond. I consider those my heroes. And as Al Reyes and Nat talked about today, the importance of having important people, children, and how important it is for them to have someone in their lives. We think that this concept and the thoughts that you have brought are in line with the goals of building strong brains. So we appreciate you all participating. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, it's after lunch. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. There we are. It's after lunch, so you've got to practice. Uh, be very intentional about your assertiveness and your energy. Uh, it is my great honor to be here today to introduce my good friend and colleague, Dr. Don Schwartz, who is the Senior Vice President for Programs at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, and his role in his role there he guides their strategies on building a culture of health in America enabling everyone to live the healthiest life possible so you can see why he's been invited here today to talk about building strong brains I, I, I was asked to keep this short and it is after lunch and now we follow doc, mr. Rogers um, so I just want to say a couple of things I've been promised that because it's after lunch, you guys are gonna enjoy a very interactive presentation. So get ready to start moving and thinking and talking amongst yourselves as he challenges you. But also I want you to understand that as we have proceeded through today, this has been a very enthusiastic, energizing, educational, informative, and I think uplifting moment in the history of building strong brains. So Don, take it away. Thank you, Alpha. Good afternoon. Wow. Okay, too much lunch. So, I am going to, since I come from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is the largest foundation in this country, spending its money only on health, I am going to contribute to your health. At the same time, I am going to prepare you to be awake and receptive to what I have to say. So we're going to practice. I am going to ask a question. You are going to respond if your response is a yes by standing up and saying, that's me. That's right, push back from the table. If you haven't done this before, you need a little room. So, who here heard this morning at least one thing that was new to them? Stand up if it's you and say, very good. Boy, people in Tennessee, I have to say, do better than people in a lot of other states at getting the directions. Okay, so who here works in a nonprofit organization? Good. Who here works in government? Good. Who here works in schools? And who here works in health or health care? Oh, very lonely. Mm -hmm. Who here works in philanthropy? See where they are, everybody? Look around. Good. And who works in banking or a financial institution? We're going to be talking about that. Who here works in real estate development? Now, wait a minute. Yay! Is this not a gathering to talk about collaboration and collaborating to improve the lives and brains of children? So we're going to talk about who's not here. Now, before we do that, I want to try to see if I can move you all along a little bit so that you'll appreciate where I go. So we're going to start with some more questions. Who here cares about children's mental health? 
Good. Who here cares about high school graduation rates? Who here cares about children's fifth grade math scores? And what you have all seen is you might as well stay standing. Who here cares about asthma in children? And who here cares about workforce productivity? And who here cares about capital investments in children and families? And who here cares about stormwater management? Ah, remember the tapping of the pen. So, yes or no? Yes or no? Do those of low income fare worse than those of higher income after big storms and flooding? Does stormwater management influence what happens to people in floods? Does poor stormwater management make mold infestation more likely? Good. Does a community with mold infested homes have a higher risk of asthma hospitalizations in children? All of you from healthcare, you heard that? Good. Stormwater, mold, hospitalization. Does a community with mold-infested homes have more stress-related symptoms in families? And is the likelihood that a parent smokes or drinks or uses substances more likely in a place with more stress? And are parents who are stressed more likely to miss work days? And are children more likely to complete high school? Good, good. Listening, good. And how about children's chances of getting a good job after high school? Are they better living in a community with high stress? Okay. Now... Are fifth graders more likely to do their homework if they live in a house with mold infestation? And is a community that has mold infestation and kids who don't do well in school and parents who don't show up to work and high rates of smoking and substance use, is that community attractive to new business? Mm. So are employers likely to look for communities with mold and stormwater problems and high stress and parents who use substances? No. Hmm. And worker productivity, is that likely to be high in those communities? No. And are those communities likely to be able to get loans from banks to improve themselves? Hmm. And are real estate people likely to be looking at those communities in good ways? Okay. So given all this, what are the most important interventions that you all should be doing to prevent ACEs in children? You can sit down. So... I come here because the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation believes in cross-sector collaboration. And what we're seeing across the country is that in community after community after community, that collaboration is expanding in very exciting ways. Partnerships that nobody understood or thought had to happen before are suddenly beginning to happen. So that people who are working on children's mental health actually are advocating for better stormwater management. And people who have spent their careers thinking about stormwater are working in homeless shelters to assure that children's brains are developing well. And the common, common thought that brings everybody together is that we all want and need healthy children and families for the future of this country. So you are part of the mainstream, right? Yes, good. Because too often, I think, 
In place after place, people who work on ACEs think of themselves as either isolated or the only ones or at the leading edge. And actually, if we frame it right, everyone in this country cares about and everyone should be working to prevent ACEs from happening, right? Right? Okay, lunch is setting in. I am determined. Okay, with that background, I want to tell you a story. So, this is Todd. Todd was the front page story of the Philadelphia Inquirer, my hometown now, in November of 2010. And he was the front page story because his mother, Myra, had been a nursing assistant. And, and in 2007, just in advance of or during the recession, she lost her job. And so Todd and his mother moved from where they had lived before to a smaller place, to a smaller place, to a smaller place, until they were in the apartment that they had been in for about five months before Todd's first hospitalization at age four for asthma. And he continued to get hospitalized for asthma over and over and over again. And with his hospitalization for asthma, he didn't go to school, and his mother stayed home and tried to pursue all of the utility companies that she needed to go to to make sure that they still had electricity and they had running water and the home was habitable. But mold in this house constantly sent Todd back to the hospital. In the end, in 2010, somebody added up what the health system had spent in three years for Todd. And that came to well north of a half a million dollars. For half a million dollars, Todd and his mother could have had stable housing, she could have had job retraining, and the family could have moved on without the trauma. But that's not what happened. You saw Linda Mays from the Yale Study Center in Matt's slides, Nat's slides. And one of the things that she talked about briefly was imagine what it's like when there's no let up in stress hormones. When people just live bathed in their brains in stress hormones. That was Todd. You guys have seen this lovely tree, and I pointed out for Bill, who drew an incredible tree in the last, Bill Nixon, in the last uh, exercise. You guys have seen this? Yes, no, yes, no. Wake up, wake up, yes, no. Okay, so this is from Wendy Ellis and Bill Dietz, and it's a tree that tries to represent what's called the pair of aces. At the top is adverse childhood experiences that we've talked about this morning, that are familiar to all of you, and that many of you are engaged in trying to change, help, remediate. Yes? Okay. So, we heard earlier today the questions, what's wrong with this child and what happened to this child? The folks and the services and the issues at the top of this are all about what's wrong with a child and what's happened to a child. There are places in the country that are thinking, as are you, about what to do about this. And I'm going to mention, since I come from a national foundation, I'm invited to Tennessee, I have to bring with me a few examples from other places. I'll get back to Tennessee, but forgive me. Who here has been in Hennepin County, Minnesota? Good, okay. So Hennepin County, on the county health rankings, hopefully everybody has seen the county health rankings, countyhealthrankings.org, where you can get information on every county and every state in terms of the health of children and families. Hennepin County is 44th out of 87 counties in Minnesota for all of health outcomes. So in the middle of the state. In Hennepin County, they decided that they needed to improve their ranking. 44th was not good enough. 
And so they began a Medicaid Early Childhood Innovation Lab. And in that lab, funded by both the state and the federal government, ultimately, they tried to address, they've tried to address family trauma and the opioid epidemic by bringing together child welfare, criminal justice, public health, public hospitals, Medicaid managed care plans, primary care providers, and they're all focused on early childhood. That should sound familiar to everyone here as an approach, because I think many of you are engaged in that work and many of you are successful in that work. Nod your head yes if I'm correct. Good, okay, we're not asleep, but we're getting tired. I hear you. Okay, in Spartanburg, South Carolina, they were concerned that rates of teenage pregnancy were extraordinary and that young parents not only raised their children alone in many cases, but they didn't have the same set of skills for raising their, child, their children. And they thought we could do one of two things. We could continue to invest as we are in teen parent programs, which we need to do, but maybe we should try to prevent teen pregnancy because the rates are so high. And they brought together people from the schools and community-based organizations and healthcare providers, and importantly, the faith community, key leaders, parents, and young people themselves. And between 2008 and 2014, teen birth rates decreased by 53% overall and 55% among African-American girls. Success. Not different from what you are doing. Collaboration among those who touch their hands on people who are either vulnerable or at risk or can be identified and can be helped through better coordinated systems and approaches. In 2015, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funded something called MARC, which is a group of communities around the country, 14 of them at the state level or more locally, to bring together their work cross sectors to address issues around ACEs and toxic stress. In fact, it's how I met Mary Rolando, or Mary Rolando met me, and the MARC communities continue to excel at what they're doing and form a great peer group around the country. But I have to say, in the time period that MARC has been going the last three years, the work that has gone on here in Tennessee is extraordinary. You guys are ahead of the curve in terms of your pace for bringing together different people, different constituencies, different groups, new projects, new ways of thinking, evaluation and research to address this critical issue in terms of children and families. The All Children Excel, ACE Nashville Collective, Universal Parenting Places, East Tennessee ACEs Knowledge Mobilization Team, and of course the ACEs Awareness Foundation are just a few examples that I heard about as well as Healthy Nashville. But how many of you here have heard of Invest Health in Jackson and Knoxville? And how many people here have heard of Spark? Yay, Spark! Anyway, um, both of these are collaborative efforts in communities around Tennessee and nationally to change the conditions in which people live. Not to look at the top half of the tree, but to look at the roots. To get to those adverse community environments and change those environments. And to not do it alone, but to go after the really hard things like poverty and discrimination collectively in communities and change the opportunities that people have to live healthy lives. We heard this morning a bit about poverty and people ask the question about whether poverty as such a global issue, which isn't included in the original ACEs, but most people I think would say it's an ACE. We heard about poverty. And nationally, as we hear about poverty, the big question that I get when I talk is, well, all the things that can be done about poverty are either really complicated or uh, we just don't think it can happen. And even if we did something about poverty, 
Like, would it make that big a difference? Well, how many people here know about the Great Smoky Mountain study? A few. Good. Well, the Great Smoky Mountain study happened just over the border in North Carolina. And it was one of the larger studies of children's and ultimately adults' mental health. So I don't know the Great Smokies, but supposedly that's a good picture. You guys will have to tell me if I got it right. This was a study that began in 1993 with 1,420 youngsters aged 9 to 13. Very important age, 9 to 13. And I'm going to come back again several times from here forward about age. So remember, 9 to 13. The kids were recruited from 11 counties in North Carolina, and they were recruited in order to begin to understand how poverty and other factors ultimately affected mental illness, both in children and in adults, and how treatment changed the course of that progression from childhood into adulthood. Everybody with me? All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what they found was that there actually is a really important progression from children until adulthood, and they began to map out some of the, the important pieces. But at the same time, this particular set of counties included, as you probably know better than I do, a Cherokee Indian reservation. And that Cherokee Indian reservation, during that time, opened its first casino. Anybody been to the casino? A few, good. And it turned out that of all the kids in the study, 350 of them were Cherokee children. So this study allowed people to understand what happened to the mental health and mental illness in children during a time when a major change occurred in their environment. And the major change was when the casino opened, the tribe had resources. And the woman chief of the tribe decided, we're going to try an experiment. Rather than creating a big bank account, we're going to take the resources that we earn, and we're going to give them to every member of this tribe who is a child. And it's going to change over time. Depending on how much income we make, that's how much income people will get. So what happened was that over the first four years, finally, people got about $6,000 from the casino business. And what happened with that was, on this slide you see on the left-hand side, poverty among non-Indian families, what percent are living in poverty, and on the right, Native American or Indian Cherokee families during the same period of time. And the main thing you need to see is that the rate of poverty went down substantially. So in the first two years, the rate of poverty in Cherokee children was reduced by 14%. $6,000 over four years is not a lot of money, but really important. More importantly, at the end of the study, what they found was that the rate of psychiatric disorders and symptoms among children in those families declined significantly. Just giving a small income supplement to those children and families within a tribal situation. So this was a shared resource where everyone made a common decision to invest in children. Made a substantial difference. On average, over the period of this time, families received $35,000, more than one child. They had a third less psychiatric disorders in children. And those reductions when those children grew into young adults were particularly around alcohol use, cannabis use, or substance dependence, which are pretty costly things to a tribe or society. What it shows is that poverty itself can be fixed with money. And if we do something about poverty with money, it may actually make a big difference to the health and to issues that we think of as so intertwined with ACEs. So, in this country, as you guys know, 
Poverty is generally about place. Where you are, in many ways, determines your opportunities for earning, your opportunities for your livelihood, how discriminated you may be, and how likely it is that your community will get better over time. I don't know if you've all seen the CDC's, the Centers for Disease Control's 500 cities reports, but now for cities with 50,000 or more people, excuse me, 70,000 or more people uh, throughout the country, you can get at the census tract level 27 measures of health. Census tract is like the neighborhood. So we can begin to look. This is for Nashville. You can see, you know better than I do. On the left-hand panel, you can see poverty in Nashville. And on the right-hand panel, you can see mental health among adults in Nashville. And here's the same for Memphis. And you can look at other cities in Tennessee, and you can look at other cities across the country, and we can begin to pick out neighborhoods. And with those neighborhoods, we can compare across cities. Neighborhoods where poverty and mental health issues don't go together to try to figure out what are the resilience factors in those neighborhoods. What we know, though, is nearly one-fifth of all Americans live in neighborhoods that make it hard to be healthy, and that number gets bigger to about one-quarter of children. We are raising our children in places where we know it will not be easy for them to be healthy. And the question is, what can we do about that, and how do we understand what's going on in those neighborhoods? I think all of us have had the experience of driving through a neighborhood where we know there's disadvantage. You sort of know it in your gut. You may know it because of the color of people's faces. You may know it because you won't see a supermarket. You may know it because trash hasn't been picked up or the schools don't look so good, or you're afraid and you get that scared feeling in the pit of your stomach, or the streets aren't as well paved, or the lights don't work. We all know disadvantaged communities. But part of the question is, where are they? What makes them disadvantaged? Is there something specific that we have to do? Independent of what we've learned from the Cherokee Nation, that money helps, what specifically needs to happen? So I'm going to show you through the rest of this a series of maps. And the idea of these maps is to begin to think about what's going on in Tennessee compared to the rest of the country. Because for many of the issues that you're dealing with, if resources are important, the resources that Tennessee receives and the way Tennessee uses its resources is pretty critical for making a difference to the conditions that affect the lives of children and families. So this is neighborhood disadvantage. It's a measure that was first released this year in an article from the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm happy to provide the reference for anyone who wants to see it. And as best as I can do it, I put these funny ellipses over Tennessee. You guys can laugh at me as somebody who's a northerner and doesn't quite know where exactly, but I tried my best. Here's cancer death rates or heart disease. What we know at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, where we care about the health of everyone in this country, if we don't pay attention to neighborhood disadvantage, we will continue to see disproportionate cancer rates and disproportionate deaths from heart disease, and in fact, lower rates of life expectancy at birth. I want to say one thing today about life expectancy at birth. One of the things that county after county and state after state has said to us is life expectancy at birth, that is children's chances of living a long life, which is pretty fundamental. Children's chances of living a long life. When we give it to people at the county level or the state level, they say, eh, tell me what's going on in my backyard. So you may or may not know that yesterday, for the first time ever, the US government released at the census tract level, so that's the neighborhood level, life expectancy at birth for every child in this country. So if you want to go to your neighborhoods, rural, urban, or suburban, anywhere in Tennessee or anywhere in the country, you can now go and find life expectancy at birth for every child in your community. And you can begin to say, why is it that children on that side of the street and children on that side of the street don't have the same opportunity for a long life? What's going on in our places 
that within this community, compared to a community that's five blocks away or five miles away, children don't all have the same opportunity for a long life. One of the other things that I hear a lot is, even if we do this, so let's say we picked up all of the children in the north part of Memphis and we moved them to the south part of Memphis. Would that make things better? And many people say, no, it's about the parents. No, it's about the family. Do conditions make a difference to opportunity? Just conditions. Living with the same family, do conditions make a difference? Well, in 1994, the federal government, through the Housing and Urban Development Department, did an experiment, a real randomized controlled experiment, like the ones that we heard about earlier. And they said to 4,600 families in five cities listed on the slide, we are going to, if you agree, randomly assign you, you're currently living in public housing in a poor community in this city. And we're going to give you, by chance, one of three opportunities. One opportunity is a new house, new apartment in this community because they picked people who were in poor communities in public housing where the public housing was being demolished. God bless you. And they said to those folks, a third of you get to stay in this community and other public housing developments. A third of you get a housing voucher. Go anywhere you want. And a third of you get a housing voucher, and we are moving you to wealthy communities, to scattered site apartments in those communities. Everybody get it? So what happened was for two of the groups, people who stayed in public housing in their neighborhood, people who got a housing voucher, they ended up staying in the same neighborhoods. And the other folks moved by requirement to wealthier neighborhoods. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and when that happened, HUD then followed these three random groups. And they found that after three years, the mental health of both the parents and their sons who moved to the low poverty neighborhoods, and only those who moved to the low poverty neighborhoods got better. For daughters, there was no change. After 10 to 15 years, the movers had lower rates of obesity, severe obesity, and diabetes. Pardon me, excuse me. Nobody has looked at the health of those children 20 years later. It's now 20 years since it happened but you will see the results of what happened to the health of those children in about three months. But what somebody did do was they got the social security records for all of the children and families who started off in the randomized cohorts, so all three groups, and they followed them for 20 years to see what happened to the economic opportunities of the children, not of the parents. Remember. The only difference among these three groups is that one group got moved to a higher income community. And what's in a higher income community? Better food, better roads, better schools, better, better, better. Same parents, same families, same children, randomly assigned. This is from the New York Times, and I'm going to walk you through it because I can't figure out how to make it simpler. But what this is is a graph, and on the bottom is the age of the child at the time of the move, and it's in years. So on the very far left side is age nine, which is the youngest age of children who they could track who moved, and over here is 21. And at the top, that house that looks a little prettier and has trees is people, all of the kids in the neighborhoods where those people who moved to wealthier neighborhoods, that's what those kids looked like in terms of their income as they aged. And on the bottom is the families who lived in the poorer communities, not just the ones who moved. 
And what you see is that the younger a child is, the more that child economically looks like the other children in the wealthy community. But as children are older when they move, that effect goes away. So the conditions, just as we heard earlier from Al, the conditions early in a child's life, as you all know, are critical not only to brain development, as we talk about executive function, but how much that child is going to earn throughout that child's life, the economic opportunity of that child. And we now know it through a randomized controlled trial. And we now know it through a randomized controlled trial that has been scrutinized by everybody. So simply moving children to better neighborhoods with the same families makes a difference to the economic opportunities of those children. And we can all think about, is that because those children's executive function is better? Is that because their cognitive function is better? Is that because, is that because? The reality of the situation is we could all put together a simple message. Children who grow up with opportunity use that opportunity and do better. And the earlier we move those children, the better they do. If we wait until they're adults, we don't see any effect. It is critical, it is critical to do the right thing for every child early in life if we want every child to have an opportunity in this country. Now, the guy who did this analysis, his name is Raj Chetty. When he did this analysis, he thought, you know, hmm, there are a lot of places in this country where we know there are really bad conditions for poor kids. We know there are a lot of places in this country where there are poor kids growing up, but the conditions are pretty good. Why don't we look at the county level at every county, at poor children, and use social security records for the whole country, called big data, for the whole country, and look over 20 years and see what happens in every county to poor children who grow up in that county. So make one of these curves and put a county as a point on this curve to see how its children do, its poor children do. And then let's think of whether those are counties of high opportunity or low opportunity. And there's the map of counties in this country. And what it shows in blue is counties where a poor kid can grow up and have a chance. And what it shows in red is counties where a poor kid is going to be worse off than even his or her parents. And I circled Tennessee, which is in the middle. So Tennessee doesn't do as badly as some other places. The bad places out west, I should point out, are generally Native American or tribal places. And you guys know the southeast better than I do. But Tennessee's in the middle. I come from Philadelphia. And Philadelphia is just a little bit above the middle. It's a better place for kids to grow up, perhaps. Of note, of the 100 largest cities in this country, when you look at the census tract level, the city where African-American boys have the worst chance of ultimately coming out better economically was Baltimore. And Baltimore has had some pretty hard times in terms of what goes on for African-American boys. But how come? What is it that makes those communities different? Is it spending on schools? Is it Medicaid expansion? We don't know the answer. But public intervention probably makes a difference and probably correlates pretty highly with what happens to children and what their opportunities are within communities. So just imagine what could happen if rates of adverse child, to adverse childhood experience rates, if we improve the physical and social environments in a community through broader cross-sector collaboration. If everybody, everybody, the people who build communities, the people who staff communities, the people who help those children and families who are struggling, everybody work together on collaboration in order to assure not that every child who was traumatized was identified and helped, but that there were no children who experienced trauma because of the conditions in which they lived. Can we even imagine what that would be like? To do that, 
we probably need to bring community development and child development together. And what I want to do for the rest of my time is to tell you that it's happening, to explain where and how it's happening, and maybe even get you a little bit interested in having more than just one person who does real estate in the room. Everybody with me? Good. So, how many people here have been to East Lake Meadows in Atlanta? Or played golf at East Lake Golf Course? Okay, there's one or two. All right, so, in 1995, East Lake Meadows was the worst public housing development in Atlanta. At that time, as you can see, they had 18 times the rate the national rate of crime. They had $35 million worth of local drug trade, the most of any development in small neighborhood in Atlanta. 40% of the units were uninhabitable, which does not mean they weren't inhabited, and even inhabited by families with children. 30% of the kids in the development ever graduated from high school, and 15% of the adults were employed. And what happened? Two women in that development got really angry. And they stormed into the housing department for the city of Atlanta. And instead of getting turned away, the woman who was the deputy director of housing for the city of Atlanta said, OK, you want to make it better? I'll help. This new deputy director, who had only been there a year, came from banking and investment. And she couldn't understand why housing developments in Atlanta couldn't be better. So she joined with these two women. And they said, we are going to find every opportunity to invest and improve this housing development. And we're going to give everybody an opportunity to live where they want to. They can stay or they can go. But if they stay, they're going to live in better places. And we're going to use the resources that we can do, both the public housing resources private investment, anything we can find, grants and philanthropy. And in 2018, that's a picture of the same building having been redone. There's been an 86% reduction in crime, 97% reduction in violent crime, 99% of the kids in this community graduate from high school on time, 100% of those who graduate have a college acceptance, and 100% of the able-bodied adults are employed. I would call that a victory, yes? Exactly. In 1995, 100% of the people living in this community were African American. In 2018, 100% of the people living in this community are African American. Now, that's segregation. But it's segregation with opportunity which is not good enough, but it's better than the alternative. And what is happening now in that community is extraordinary when it comes to the schools. Because remember, schools are a critical part of children's development, as you know. So the villages of East Lake, as they're now called, you see on the far side, on the left, their new high school. I looked at it and thought, wow, that's like an industrial park. No, new high school. You see the playing fields. And if I got you a close-up on those playing fields, what was most extraordinary to us from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation when we went there was we didn't see an overweight child, not one. And we looked at them and we said, mm, how'd you do it? What was your intervention? We've been after obesity for a decade. We're still not winning. What did you do? They said, we haven't done anything for obesity. Food's available. They have exercise. And the parents are employed. Kids go to school. Nobody's obese. Here you have the kids playing golf. One of the master's golf courses is East Lake. It's right next to the development. One of the first things that people did in 1995 was to march over to the golf course and say, you hate us being here next to you. Employ us. And we guarantee that in 20 years, you're going to love us. The Masters loves this community. They are investing in scholarships for the 20 top golf playing kids in the high school. And there you see the largest collection of student harpists in Georgia. 
It's a beautiful place. If you haven't visited, I encourage you to. Purpose Built believes that you need a community quarterback who didn't exist before things started to get better. That is, they create anew with local philanthropy a community quarterback who doesn't have any history in the community, who doesn't have any preconceived ideas, who only has front and center the betterment of children and families in the community. And they bring together mixed income housing, so poor people and not poor people all living in the same place, cradle to college education pipelines, and community wellness, period. Simple. They create better environments and children do better. One of the things that we're helping them do is look at what has happened to ACEs within the community, but we're just starting that work. These are where purpose-built communities are located across the country. That's the name now of the model that they've created. They want to be in every state. They don't yet have a site in Tennessee, I'm just saying, and they may be talking to people here. I don't know. But in your communities, you have an opportunity to have the model come to you for free. So what I want to say in the last couple minutes is I think for too long, those of us who have worked to stop adverse childhood experiences and their impacts on children have not thought big enough. So I want you to think bigger. How many people have been to Itabina, Mississippi? Yes. How many people have seen the community garden in Itabina? A couple. Well, the community garden in Itabina was started by seniors who had learned farming and gardening from their parents, and they began teaching teenagers and other kids because they couldn't do the heavy lifting themselves. Itabina is one of the poorest communities in Mississippi. 19%, 19% of the children in Itabina are no longer food insecure because of the food that's grown and kept, either uh, canned or otherwise, from this garden. It's an enormous community resource. What I love, in the background, you can sort of see the new housing that is developed in Itabina. Itabina is a community that is trying to move itself forward. You got to think bigger. So how big, particularly for all of you who have expertise that I have to tell you the people in community development around the country would salivate over all that you know and all that you can do and all that you can offer. This is Potrero Hill Public Housing in San Francisco. It is one of the four remaining public housing developments in San Francisco, and it has been the worst. It's built on a hill, as you might think, and it is awful. There are units at Potrero that still have dirt floors. We took a tour of Potrero, and at one point we had a choice. We could walk through a place that was lined with old condoms or a place that was lined with injection needles. And it was the pathway that the children of this community had to follow to go to school every day. But the San Francisco Public Housing Authority and the mayor's office and others have come together, and they are rebuilding Potrero. But they're not just building a new public housing development. They're building the first, in California, trauma-informed public housing development. Anybody here ever heard of a trauma-informed public housing development? It doesn't exist. They're creating it from the ground up. And they're doing it by taking the best of trauma theory and the best partnerships, not just with academics, but with practitioners, to figure out how do we create a place where people don't have to wait in line? How do we create a place where the people, you know, the children in public housing have positive experiences? How do we create a place where we build in incomes, uh, employment supports for parents? How do we tie it to public transit? What do we have to do about the food environment? Let's create this community from the ground up to not traumatize our children. And they're doing it. And they're happy to share what they're doing with anybody in this room. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about hospitals. Since there are some healthcare people here, and there's some other people who should be fingering healthcare people here. Hospitals, I think, are an incredible resource. And I want every hospital in the country to invest in its community. Now, many who are here will say hospitals are investing in their community. And I know that there are people here who are working in hospitals and health systems that are doing that investment. 
I want to change your view because I want you to think bigger. So, if hospitals invest in their community, they get healthier patients. And these days, if you have healthier patients, you can make a lot of money. We know from a report that was done looking across the country at what hospitals are doing in their communities that hospitals and health systems have a variety of assets, assets, such as financial resources, land, and expertise that would make them valuable participants in the community investment system. A small but significant cohort of institutions have taken bold steps and engaged in investment discussions on transactions. In other words, hospital CFOs have suddenly said, we got to invest in communities if we want healthier people. And when they do it, they not only get healthier patients with lower health care costs, but their reputation gets better as good citizens. That's a good thing. And they have lower costs for safety and physical plant maintenance. And it's easier to recruit staff. And you have healthier staff, so their health care costs go down. So there's an economic reason for hospitals to invest in making the conditions in communities better for children and families. And it's happening. So the big thing that happens, though, that nobody talks about is when communities around hospitals get better, property values go up. So the hospital's value goes up. So what could a health system provide to community investing? Rather than hospitals saying, we're going to have the world's best program to heal people with ACEs, which we need to do. I am not saying that's not important. But in addition, how about investing in making it so the next generation of children aren't exposed to trauma? In Camden, New Jersey, one of the poorest communities in New Jersey, the health system in Camden decided that the communities around the hos their hospital, Cooper University Hospital, were horrible and children were growing up under horrible circumstances. This is one of the blocks that's pretty average for the community around the hospital. Here's another. And so they said, we're going to create a revolving credit system. We're going to map every house. We're going to figure out what people need. We're going to work with our community one-on-one. -on -one. We're going to make this a better place for children, for our patients, for our employees. That was the first set of houses that they completed together with community members. And that's one of the new parks with a fountain. And what you don't see is the police who wander by, because it's now the part of Camden, New Jersey, where police most want to be assigned. Not a family was displaced from this community. Everyone who started off living in this community still lives in this community. Every house was rebuilt with people's specifications in mind. And at the end of the day, which was five years, it cost the hospital about three and a half million dollars total. That's it, which is nothing in terms of health care costs for the population living in that community. Dignity Health, oh, excuse me, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia said, this is what a playground looks like for children in one of our service areas. This is the new playground. And that's the new health center where the hospital and the city of Philadelphia and the library system for Philadelphia, and the recreation system for Philadelphia, and the park system for Philadelphia all came together in one square block to support children in a brand new environment. The greatest amount of funding came from the hospital. And then there's Dignity Health. Dignity Health is in Nevada and California. They're the largest hospital system in the country. Uh, one of the Catholic health systems, so they're very mission-driven. They give direct loans, they give investments of various kinds, lines of credit, link deposits, and so forth. Generally, they do it over a relatively short period of time and at a low interest rate. And in, for instance, San Bernardino, California, they're using their expertise as people who have to build buildings because they build lots of hospitals to teach people in San Bernardino how to pull down every possible dollar that's available in order to rebuild communities that are really entrenched and poor, where children are growing up in the worst conditions in San Bernardino. So 
How does it happen? Well, hospitals have to do community benefit. You guys have heard that, perhaps. Anybody heard that hospitals have to do community benefit? Anybody here paid for through hospital community benefit? Yeah. Mm, okay. Well, it's required of all nonprofit hospitals since the passage of the Affordable Care Act, and it still exists, despite all the changes in the Affordable Care Act. It has to be reported for every hospital every year on what's called their 990 form, Schedule H, Parts 1 and 2. It's not easy to find, but you can. We're making it easier for everyone to find it online. I'm happy to give you the website. Most of the dollars go to what are called unreimbursed patient expenses, which is what the hospitals have to discount their insurance costs for uh, insurers. But in Tennessee, about $40 million each year comes from hospitals for community health improvement and community building, not patient care expenses, real community building. That's more than the state of Tennessee puts in annually for all of its community development investment. The scale of hospitals and healthcare systems is such that it dwarfs the scale of community improvement investments. Tiny investments in communities can make an enormous difference to the conditions for children and families. And there are federal resources, and there are private resources, and once somebody creates an investable opportunity, communities can improve. One new opportunity is called Opportunity Zones. It passed with the new tax bill. And it creates incentives for people of wealth who own property to transfer, when they sell that property, the wealth into communities of entrenched poverty throughout the country. The blue spaces on this map are opportunity zones in Tennessee, where investment is now an inducement for people who want to put their wealth into community building in places with entrenched poverty. So remember Todd? Well, Todd's story began, <clears throat> remember, in 2007. In 2017, Todd and his mother had connected to actually a community development group in Philadelphia. They are living in spectacular housing. Todd is now getting ready. He's in high school. He's looking at colleges. His mother is employed. She's gone back to school. She's doing great. And Todd no longer gets hospitalized for his asthma. It can happen. But the kinds of partnerships that were required to make it work for Todd included those people who did case management, <clears throat> the social service system that was getting ready to take Todd away from his mother, the health care system that was providing lots of service at very high cost for Todd, bankers, investors, housers, people who understood more than the homeless system, but rather the low-income housing system, and then people who made all of that come together, the people who link in the middle. You guys are on the right path, and you have enormous opportunities. None of you will be people who are going to be building houses or changing conditions, because you have expertise that's critical, but it's particularly critical to people in other sectors that you might not have thought of partnering with. I'm here to say, change the conditions. Think bigger. Don't just think, how do we take damaged children and help them? That's really important, but think bigger. In a generation, what would it be like if children no longer experienced trauma? If we don't believe it can happen, it won't. In your hearts, you have to begin to believe that we can have a society, we can have states and cities, where children no longer have to experience trauma. Thank you for all you do. <laughs> Thanks so much, John. Uh, and now we're going to open it up for questions. And may I start with a question? <laughs> and this one, really, I. My colleagues and I have been, at, at, who are members of the Coalition for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practice, have been talking recently about a, a growing concern. And at, at one point, uh, very few people knew what ACEs are. 
But now, people are tending to call everything ACEs. So discrimination is an ace, and racism is an ace, and inequality is an ace, and police brutality is an ace, and poverty is an ace. And so while all of those things certainly affect the healthy development of children and families and communities, and poverty may have an impact on the level of parental incarceration, which is an ACE, or drug addiction, which isn't a family drug addiction, which is a, an, and the abuse and neglect. But my concern is calling everything an A. So I wonder if you have any comments about that and how the foundation may be thinking about that. So I think you're completely right that particularly if we're going to talk about research and investigation and understanding the impact of ACEs, we have to be scrupulous. We have to know what we're talking about. Remember that the ACE study was done in 1998. We've learned a lot since then. And I think we all have to be accepting of the fact that the definition of what causes trauma to children can now perhaps be created in a different way because as the folks at Harvard will tell you, and Al talked to me last night, we're thinking about how to better measure that traumatizing stress in the lives of children. We know it's stress that changes the way brains develop and grow. So if we can figure out what are the things that cause stress and we can reduce those stresses, does it matter what we call them and how we label them? I think the importance of ACEs is that it has helped us as research be able to say with certainty that brain development is impacted by certain kinds of trauma and that stress is a critical common factor. But I think we all need to be prepared to give up a small list of things that may be called ACEs in the long run in order to have children who live in less stressful, who live less stressful lives. So other questions? Uh-huh. Sure. Um, the question was, there's a big price tag, $200 million of investment, private investment, under the purpose-built communities. That's private development and bank investment in those communities. Because as you know, to do development at scale, somebody has to invest. The issue with investment is, can you get a return on your money? And the general way that people get a return on money when you invest in housing is by rents or ownership and getting fees back. And that's there to say what has happened at Purpose Built is people have been able to get a return on their investment by investing in poor communities because the communities get better, people get better, the conditions get better, and lots of people now, the school to send your kids to in Atlanta, if you're going to the private, private the, excuse me, the public school system, is that high school I showed you. So that's an integrated high school. That's a high school that everybody wants their kids to go to in Atlanta. That means there's value in that neighborhood and that value translates to private investment. They now have grocery stores and drug stores and banks and everything else that are growing up as retail within the community because it's a desirable place for people to invest. And they require, they require that 50% of all the units in that community be low income and still there is a return on investment. Well, we have done an absolutely phenomenal job of staying on time, so we're gonna close out this session and thank uh, Don once again. <laughs> <laughs>